welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Michael Patrick Barber, author of Salvation, What Every Catholic Should Know, published by the Augustan Institute, Ignatius Press, and available through our EWTN religious catalog. Michael, nice to have you on the program. I think it's the first time we've ever gotten you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks uh, so much. This is not the first book you've written. Now, your last name, Barber, some people from radio, and mm -hmm. even in the way back in the past, might remember mm -hmm. Terry Barber, right? right. Any, yes. any re relationship Yeah, he's there? my dad's brother. He's okay. my uncle. Yeah. So, did he help you get uh, involved in, in, in this kind of Catholic work? Well, uh, I mean, my, my family's devout, ca devout Catholic family. So right. yeah, Terry was always very encouraging. My uncle's a priest. Right. Uh, my other, my mom's brother's uncle. So uh, I have a lot of family. So, support. so it runs, run, runs in the family. <laughs> right. Runs in the DNA there. Yeah. Now, salvation. What every Catholic should know. Sometimes it seems today that if you listen to certain people talking, it sounds like either you don't need to be saved or everybody's saved. So why should we worry about it? Right. Well, really, salvation is really at the heart of the gospel. You know, every Sunday when we go to Mass, we say that the entire reason Jesus came down from heaven was for us men and for our salvation. But what's remarkable to me is how rarely we Catholics talk about salvation. I mean, if you were to go right out of Mass, right, a, right after you just said that the entire reason Jesus was born was for our salvation, right? Why did he die on Good Friday? Our salvation. Why did he rise on Easter Sunday? Our salvation. You, you, if you were to go right out of Mass into the parish hall for the eighth sacrament of coffee and donuts, right. and there you found somebody in the hall talking about how he's been saved, how Jesus is his savior. Here, I think most Catholics would wonder, is this guy a Catholic or is he just a you know a non-Catholic who's visiting our parish right, this weekend? Because the Catholics never talk about salvation. And that's right? not the way they talk about it, even if they did probably. Right. In fact, I have a dear friend, I told him I was writing this book on salvation. He's a Catholic, I told him I was writing this book on salvation. He said, Why don't you just call it how to get to heaven? And I said, and that's the problem, right? When we talk about getting to heaven, we're, we're thinking of salvation purely in futuristic terms. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way the New Testament describes salvation. It very much impinges on the here and now. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we talk about salvation in terms of just getting to heaven, we're missing out on some key aspects of the doctrine. And I'll tell you what, this is not just theological trivia. If you get these things wrong, it has major implications for your spiritual life. Right. I know uh, Brian Peachy read, read the forward, uh, wrote the forward in the beginning of the book. He talks about the fact that in his own Catholic life, and maybe this has been your experience as well, you don't hear a lot of homilies about salvation, but he right. was at the time uh, married to a Southern Baptist. He'd go to services with her almost every sermon. Right. Was, was about salvation. Right, it's really amazing. And you know, you hear people say, well, there are many who are leaving the church today because they want to go to churches where they're, where, where they're just going to get entertained. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Catholics will talk about non-Catholic Christians in that sort of uh, dismissive way, as if you know, there's no real there there. But no, the reason why many people are going to these churches mm -hmm. is because they know they need to be saved. Mm -hmm. They know that they're struggling with sin, and frankly, a lot of times in our churches, as Catholics, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about lots of other issues mm -hmm. in society, in the world, and it seems like we're missing out on really what the heart right. of the gospel is. So it's no wonder people are, are trying to find, you know, people who are talking about this. He, he yeah. used the phrase, uh, 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 the derivation, theology abhors a, a vacuum. vacuum. Yes. What do you think he meant? Well, what, he, what he's talking about there is if you neglect a certain truth, then someone's going to try to come in and fill it, mm -hmm. right? And so I, th I think w when it comes to salvation, we talk about grace, for example. Uh, now I, a lot of Catholics don't really seem to think about grace much more than as a prayer before meals. We mm -hmm. don't really talk about, even though it's in the prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, right? What is grace? It's well, so important. Well, I have know? to say, prior to Vatican II, right. you heard a lot about sanctifying grace oh, yes, all the time. Oh, yes, Sure, uh, right. And now after Vatican II, not that, the, that there was any change in anything, but it tended not to be the way it got talked about. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a shame because it really, again, is at the heart of the message of the New Testament, the gospel message. Paul talks about grace over and over again in his letters. And it, it's, it's really quite a shame that we don't talk enough about it as Catholics. You know, for a while I was a college professor. Mm -hmm. Now I'm at the Augustine Institute Graduate School of Theology. 
And, uh, and you know, I taught a class every year on sacramental theology. It was required, all the students had to take it. And inevitably, every year, before I taught the class, a student would come up to me before the first session and say, Dr. Barber, I've been Catholic my whole life. I don't think I need to take your class. I know all this stuff already. Mm. And I'd say, oh, do you think you could test out of the class? Oh, yes, definitely. All right, let's test out of the class. Mm. You mean right now? Yeah, right now. Sure. All right, three questions. You ready? First question. All right, what's the first question? Hosanna. We say it at every Mass. Hosanna in the highest. So what does it mean? Mm. And they look at me, well, what do you mean? That, well, Hosanna, you say it at every Mass. What does the word Hosanna mean? Mm -hmm. See, we Catholics, we say these terms, we use these words, and we don't often reflect on their meaning. By the way, it means save us or mm -hmm. salvation. Mm -hmm. That's what Hosanna means. Other words, too, Mass. You know, that was the second question on my test. Uh, usually they got that one wrong. They would say something like, Hosanna means praise. Mm -hmm. right. Right. That's not right. right. So uh, I, the second question would be Mass. Why do we call it Mass? That doesn't sound like something I want to celebrate. It sounds like something I want surgically removed from my body, right? right. right. Um, why do we call it? Well, it comes from the Latin, you know, Misa, mm. where we get the word mission. The Mass is what sends us out on our mission. Grace is another word, one of those words, right? No one ever passed that test, by the way, right. <laughs> because Catholics don't know these terms. Grace, it means gift. That's the right. word in Greek, charis. It's the term Paul uses. And uh, we don't reflect on that, I think, nearly enough because... Uh, if we do, we recognize one thing, and that is, first off, it's for the unworthy. Mm -hmm. And many people, I think, give up on church. They mm -hmm. give up on Christ because they think, God doesn't love me anymore. I've, I've sinned too much. It's just impossible for me to come back. And, and that's, that's a really scary place to be in. And Jesus is always eating with the tax collectors and sinners. That's who the message is for. Right, right. but as you make the point in here, you talk about Zacchaeus and all yes, this, Matthew, right. the idea that some understanding that as God, as Christ said, I'm a doctor who's come for those who are sick. That's right. Uh, so I have to minister to them, but his goal is not to keep them where they are. Exactly. His, uh, his idea is to move them where they need to go. That's exactly right. It seems right. like that kind of, and even the President the Holy Father talks about encounter. Yes. Which makes a lot of sense. And accompaniment. The problem is the accompaniment part seems to get lost. It can often do that. And in fact, there are many people, I think, who even in the church today are saying things like, well, the church really needs to rethink its teaching on morality, on marriage. It's just too hard. Mm -hmm. It's unrealistic. It's too difficult. And I'd like to tell people who say that, well, if you think it's hard, if you think what Jesus is calling to is, 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 is difficult, cheer up. It's worse than you think. Yeah, you he says that. it's impossible, right? right? right. He okay. says it's impossible. Without God, with, with, he says, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. And that's where faith comes in. Do we really think God can change me? Well, it's interesting you make yeah. that point because uh, most people today tend to view ourselves as progressively getting better. We're better mm -hmm. people than before, which is why the past doesn't really matter as much. Uh, but somehow the people in the past used to be able to live within these rules and we can't. How does that work? Yeah, there is sort of an ageism there. And I, I, you know, in the past, things were so much worse. You see that. At the same time, you have people, I think, despairing of the power of grace. Mm -hmm. God loves us as we are. Make no mistake about mm -hmm. it. He loves us just as we are. We don't have to do anything to convince God that we're lovable. But he loves us too much to let us stay that way. Mm -hmm. He wants us to be transformed, and he can transform us if we will be open to his saving power. Now, uh, Dr. Peter talks about you showing over and over again what salvation is not. Right. Let's go one by. It's not self-help as in ancient Pelagianism <laughs> right. or uh, therapeutic deism, not fierce, uh, mere fire insurance right. as in like fundamentalism. Right. Come not without cost as the health and wealth gospel Right. Say. These are all the chapters in right. the book. Right. Yeah. Preached by certain televangelists as we know, not, not here, uh, not just <laughs> personal as in individualism, not just a legal transaction. Uh, a spectator sport or simply a moment or some forms of Protestantism, right. Protestantism you would say, uh, or inevitable as in universalism or not just in the future as you were alluding to before in dispensationalism, which right. is obviously a word most Catholics don't know right. what that means. But even anyway. many Catholics think of salvation as just a future reality. Right. That's not the church's teaching. But Well, what about people who would say, uh, well, I have been saved. And right. So in that way, it's, you know, I don't have to worry about it going forward. And that you get into words like, What's the difference, as you're talking about in the book, be, between salvation, redemption, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, 
there's another word that I'm uh, missing. Well, there's so many that, terms that, that are where it, people talk about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, there's there's a lot there. Uh, the first thing I'd say is uh, there's this understanding that's out there in many Christian traditions uh, that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't lose your salvation. And see, the problem with that is it misconstrues what salvation is. Salvation isn't just getting out of hell. It's mm -hmm. not just, as I say, fire insurance, mm -hmm. right? It, salvation is ultimately about being united to Christ, mm -hmm. being united to all those who are in communion with Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, but also other believers as well. And it, it, it also entails what, becoming like Christ. Mm -hmm. So people will say, well, once saved, always saved. Now it doesn't matter what sins I commit. Well, if you, if you have that mentality, mm -hmm. then you're not really understanding what it means to be saved. Paul says that believer to, our believers are to be conformed to the image of the Son. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we all want, right? Jesus says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we all know this from human experience. One of my favorite stories uh, I read every year at Christmas, I'm sure many people do, is A Christmas Carol mm -hmm. by Charles Dickens. Uh, whether it's human actors or Mickey Mouse, we're always retelling that story. It's such right. a great tale. It taps into something we all recognize, and that is if you live in a way that's selfish, you will be sad. Mm -hmm. You will be miserable. And if you learn to give yourself away, you'll mm. find fulfillment. So on the first page of uh, Charles Dickens' book, he describes Ebenezer Scrooge as a hardened sinner, mm. right? But he finds fulfillment in giving himself away. Now, the one thing I wish Dickens would have emphasized is this is only possible by God's grace, right? And, and if we will cooperate with God's grace, we can find the fulfillment of life-giving love, which mm -hmm. is what God wants us to enter into. So we just have this attitude, well, I've been saved, so it doesn't matter if I change my life or what, you know. I don't think there are real Christians who believe that when right. it comes out, down to it. I guess but, the other one know. was justification, actually. I was well, thinking, justification, yeah. that's Those a very important term, yes. Roll around together. Right. Yes. Sanctification is right. another, another aspect, one too. Another one where it right. comes. G.K. Chesterton talked about the importance of tradition, because mm -hmm. you're using the, uh, the scriptures and the catechism throughout here. Right. Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, mm -hmm. our ancestors. It is the democracy that, especially for Catholics, I think, in terms of the church triumphant and of course the church suffering and, and purgatory, and this idea that we have this line of tradition right. that we have to always reflect back on right. and stay true to. Right, and, and ultimately, this is scripture and tradition, they always work together. You know, I love Thomas Aquinas, but we'll never read Thomas Aquinas at Mass. I love uh, the writings of John Paul II. We're never going to read John Paul II's writings in the place of sacred scripture. Mm -hmm. That is the inspired word of God. So all Catholic teaching, I want to underscore in the book, mm -hmm. is flowing from a faithful reading of scripture that's in accord with the tradition of the church. And so what I want to do in every chapter mm -hmm. is give you a scripture passage and then a passage from the catechism of the church, mm -hmm. the catechism of the Catholic church draws from the fathers and doctors to show that what Catholic teaching is, right. is it's not just the opinion of some bishop now. This is what I think we ought to say. Right. No, we don't have that 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 license. Right. We need to recognize that divine revelation comes to us in sacred or, in the sacred page as it's interpreted in the tradition of the church. Or as one recent member of the hierarchy said similar to, well, would Jesus have said that or in that way if he was here today? Yeah, we, we, we know what Jesus said, essentially. We don't have the ipsissima verba, as they say, right? The Gospels use different words mm -hmm. to, to say the same things, but, uh, you know, to report the same sayings of Jesus. But we have the, as Augustine would say, we have the sense of what Jesus is saying here. And, well, well, certainly uh, yeah. our Lord understood that what he was saying was going to have impact of all time, right. not just for the people he was talking to. Right, which day. is why he had 12 apostles, mm -hmm. right, who were disciples. And, you know, in Greek, the word for disciple, it means student. Mm -hmm. And we are all called to be disciples. Which is always We're important to understand to when so many people seem to use disciple and friend yeah, when they're yeah. not really the same thing. Yeah, it's important. They can be, they're related, but there's still also another level. There. Right, and this is one of the things I want to hit hard in the book. So mm -hmm. the, I've, been, I've been very pleased the book is number one on Amazon and Catholic theology. That's wonderful. But I don't want people to just see the book as a theology book because mm -hmm. I think they, under, they misunderstand that. For a lot of people, theology is just sort of like academic trivia, right? I gotta affirm this, otherwise I'm not a heretic or something mm -hmm. like that. But 
they don't really understand how theology impacts their life. In fact, there are many people in the church today who even think that theology is an obstacle mm -hmm. to your spiritual life. And what I want to show in the book is if you get these various aspects of soteriology, the study of salvation, if you get various aspects of this wrong, you set yourself up for huge pitfalls, very dangerous traps in the right. spiritual life. So, for example, if you think of salvation as just a relationship between me and Jesus, mm -hmm. it is that, but it's not just that. But if you think it's only that, then what will happen? You won't see the need for the church. You won't see the need for the sacraments. You won't understand the need for spiritual friendship, for going to the sacrament of confession. Mm -hmm. Salvation isn't just about a personal relationship with Jesus. It's also about entering into communion with his body, the church. We need one another. Christ works right. through one another. Well, you said here to that. misunderstand salvation is to fail to understand fully who the Savior is. Oh, that's exactly right. So at right. the end of the day, the reason we study theology is not so that we can pass some theology test, right? When I first met my wife. We're not passing. Right, right. <laughs> when I first met my wife, I remember we went out on our first date. I didn't sit down with her and say, all right, what are your three favorite colors? What is your favorite food? And when's your birthday? All right, don't tell me anything more because I don't want to get, you know, confused. No, I, the, the more I, I, I got to know her, the more I loved her, the more I wanted to know about her. Mm -hmm. If you love someone, you want to know the truth about them. Mm -hmm. Same thing's true with God. If we, if we say we love God, we, we, we really need to make sure we're understanding them properly. In fact, the greatest commandment right. is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Mm -hmm. That's something that's often overlooked. In the not self-help chapter right in the beginning, yeah. you talked about grace earlier. You say grace relates to gift giving in the ancient world. Then you yeah. say ancient perspectives on gift giving help us better understand Paul's teaching about God's grace. That's right. Exactly. There's, there's a, a, a New Testament scholar, Anglican scholar named John Barclay has done a lot of work in this. And it's fascinating to look at the word Paul uses for grace. Grace wasn't a theological term in his day. The mm. word charis, it's the word translated grace. It, it doesn't appear in Greco-Roman literature primarily with a religious sense. It just means gift. And in the ancient world, what would happen is you would give a gift to someone to enable them to enter into a reciprocal relationship of giving. Mm -hmm. So gift giving was really meant to empower someone to give back. And that's what God's grace is. God gives us his grace. And the gift that he gives us mm -hmm. is the son. He gives us his own son to live in us, as Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, so that we can enter into the divine life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and share in their life. Mm -hmm. And this gift is different than gift giving in Paul's world, because in Paul's day, you had to be very careful about who you gave your gift to. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, act of, it was, it was an, uh, a major public embarrassment for someone to take a gift and walk away and not reciprocate the right. gift. Okay. Major shame, right? But what you, so what you would do in the ancient world is you had to make sure that the people you were giving your gifts to were vetted. You only gave them to the worthy. And Paul says, mm. God gives his gifts to the unworthy. Mm -hmm. While we were still enemies of God, mm -hmm. Christ died on the cross for us. Was this that, is the radical nature of grace. Was that where casting your pearls in front of swine came up? <laughs> well, it's, it's <laughs> like a different yeah, context but, there. But the, yeah. but the idea is, for many people today, God is a, a kind of authoritarian father figure. He's got his arms crossed, and he's not impressed. Mm -hmm. This isn't the God of the New Testament, right? There's wow. nothing we could ever do that would make God stop loving Let me us. ask you that question, because yeah. that's always a good point. But it, it, you know, the people feel like they can't be forgiven, and right. the other people feel that they don't need to be forgiven. Yeah. And, they, and the question is, I, in the past, I would think it was highly people afraid of you know, the, the wrath of God, so to speak. And today there's the Buddy Christ kind of effect, mm -hmm. which is that God, well, he understands. He, yeah. I mean well. Right. So it'll be okay. Yeah, I don't think... And he's all merciful. Yeah, so one of my favorite lines in the Catechism of the Catholic Church is found in Catechism number 1642. There it talks about what those who enter into the sacrament of mar marriage, matrimony, are called to. And there it says that couples are called to love each other with a tender love, but it says something more than that, which is shocking, actually. It says that couples are called to love one another with a supernatural love. Mm. Now, I'm in big trouble mm. because I can barely love in a natural way, right? Mm. But my wife is owed supernatural love from me. Mm. That is what the sacrament of marriage entails. It entails a love that I am not humanly possible of giving, mm -hmm. but with God's grace that I am. So for people who say, well, 
you know, God doesn't really care what I do. You're, you're misunderstanding what your calling is. Your calling is to become like Christ mm -hmm. and to enter into a supernatural form of love with your spouse and with God, with others, by the power of his grace. Don't sell yourself no. short. Well, I think in terms of you got faith as the work of God, and of course works yes. gets into the whole thing with the Protestant versus Catholic. You say in different ways, the New Testament makes the point that faith is the result of God's work. And then you go on to say, Peter's faith has only been made possible by the Father. It is not of flesh and blood. Yeah. What's the connection? Yeah, well, the key thing there is that uh, many people think that you're saved by faith and that your works don't actually of themselves count towards your salvation, all right? But the reality is faith itself is a gift of God. Faith itself is not possible apart from God's grace. Well, the same thing is true of our good works. Why, are, why is it possible for us to do works that have saving power? Well, it's because, again, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So faith is a gift. It's not something you can just talk someone into. Now, this is a, a constant problem that I run into out there. I, I, I give a lot of talks. I appear, you know, at Catholic parishes, do parish missions, all that. And people come up to me all the time and they say, how do I help my son? How do I help my daughter come back to the faith? What should I say? I always say, what do I say to them? And I, I have to remind them, if someone experiences the grace of conversion, it's not going to be because you had the best comeback, mm -hmm. you had the best Bible verse, you had the most witty remark. It's going to be because of the grace of God. And so the most important thing you can say is a Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. the mo if we're talking to other people about God, more than we're talking to God about the people that we love, we're in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, faith is a gift. And so if we really believe that, that has huge implications for our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we put a premium on prayer. Do we really believe what Jesus says in the Gospels? Apart from me, he says in John, mm -hmm. you can do nothing. Do we really believe that? Here's how you know. How much time did you spend in prayer today? Mm -hmm. If you can go through a whole day without spending, let's say, a half hour in prayer, you know what you told God that day? I didn't need you. Mm -hmm. I got it covered. I'm good. But are we saying then that isn't everybody offered that gift? So isn't it a, is it a question of reception? Yes, it, it, it is a question of reception. Yep, we need to pray for people to cooperate, to right. respond mm -hmm. to that To be gift. open to right. It, right. And for me, most of all, right? Mm -hmm. So it's so much easier, as Jesus says, to, to hate other people's sins, to recognize sin in other people's lives. You know, to see the, the speck in your brother's right. eye and you're missing the log in your own, right? right? The first thing we need to recognize is I need grace, I need prayer, I need the sacraments. And so we can see this very clearly. If we believe that grace is truly God's power and we believe we need it and we can't be saved without it, then we're gonna depend on prayer and the sacraments. If we don't take that seriously, mm -hmm. The first thing we're going to cross off of our things to do list each day is prayer time. Oh, I'm too busy for it. In the section, not just fire insurance, you say, and this was interesting, for Paul, the old covenant law had the role of a custodian. Mm -hmm. When the time of full maturity came, the age of the new covenant ushered in by Christ, the custodian's job was complete. Right, yes. So there I'm referring to the, the Greco Roman practice of a pedagogos. Mm -hmm. So what happened was well to do people would have a servant who would sort of be a, a custodian to their children. Mm -hmm. And Paul in Galatians uses that as an example for understanding the law and its role in salvation history. And he says, now that Christ has come, we're no longer under the custodian, under the law, as, as a servant might be today. And the whole point is this, that in Christ we are given the spirit so that the law can be written, as Jeremiah 31 would say, on our hearts, right? And, this is, again, the gift of, of God's grace and, and, and the Spirit, so that no longer are we just conf to conform to the letter of the law, but let the Spirit of the law live in us. And I think you also made the point I thought was interesting in talking about the Torah, because sometimes we think of the law, as you point out, like the Ten Commandments, or here's the 600 oh, Commandments, yes. but it's actually part of the, it's really the whole five books, basically, That's is what right. they're referring back yeah, to, Yeah, right? we have a, a, a the, there's, there are subtle forms of anti-Semitism that, that remain and linger uh, in, in just sort of popular discourse about the Bible, and it's very disturbing to me. A lot of people think of Jews as just sort of like legalistic mm -hmm. and uh, pedantic or something like that. This is very dangerous stuff because, you know, they understood that the law isn't just God's commandment, mm -hmm. right? The law is 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is primarily a story, mm -hmm. right? And what's the story about? It's about God's relationship to his people. And so when you read the first commandments in scripture, the way the first commandment begins is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Right? The first commandment is not just, you shall not worship other gods. It's contextualized in the story of God's relationship. Mm -hmm. So we understand the reason we keep the law is not just because God is judge, but because he's father, he loves us, and look at all that he's done for us, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We got a, we got a short period of time, two sure. quick things. One, salvation through the body of Christ. You talk about chaplain, mm -hmm. Father Leonard Feeney. And oh, that's where yeah. we get into, what do you do making the ancient doctrine that there is no salvation outside the church? How are we right. to understand that? Uh, you know, we hear that still, sure. especially on the web these days. Yeah, so we have to be careful of misconstruing that famous formulation that goes back to the early church. It does not mean, okay, that if you are not a Catholic, you are definitely going to hell or something like that. And, that, and that's something that we want to be very aware of as Catholics. There's a great line in the catechism. It talks about baptism, catechism number 1257. It says, God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but God himself is not bound by his sacraments. So we know that God saves through baptism, so we go out and we proclaim baptism. But we always have hope that God is working in other people's lives in mysterious right. ways that we don't understand. But if they are saved, right. it's always through Christ, whether they know it or not. Well, it barely, <laughs> it didn't, we also. barely got into uh, so much in oh, here. I, one thing I can tell you, folks, the Pharisees aren't quite as bad as sometimes they're made <laughs> out to be. You'll find out if you read this book. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you so Michael much. Barber. I appreciate it. Uh, Michael Patrick Barber, author of Salvation, What Every Catholic Should Know. Augusta Institute, Ignatius Press, our friends there, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com is the place to get it. Very interesting book. Check it out and check us out next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks. <laughs>